Thank you, John. Appreciate it. Thanks everybody for coming today. Uh, hopefully this will make some sense. This, uh, this talk was really born over the last few years. We've gotten an increasing number of requests from different towns and groups to install or implement video or electronic counts in a watershed. And so after going through the process with individual groups a few times, it seemed like maybe it was a good opportunity to come to this group where everybody's here together and talk about some of the principles, some of the cautionary notes on it, and kind of give everybody a brief overview of what's been happening. And if you were interested in this, is it appropriate and how would you do it? So we'll go right into that. Why do we count? I think you guys are all, most people here do count, so you probably have a good personal reason why you do count. But for the most part, I think at a personal level, we're talking about improving local knowledge, having participation in our community, in our ecosystems, and of course, you know, increasing that idea of stewardship of our natural resources. It's not just for the dogs, people do it too. There's a nice group of people on the Essex River, and it's great. I, this is a site where I put an electronic counter in. Uh, as you can see, it's very tight to the road here. I was very worried about vandalism, uh, just kind of reckless kids doing stuff, and my experience has been completely the opposite. I can't spend under an hour at this counter because anybody who drives by stops and talks to me. I have people taking their kids there, and it's, it's awesome. It's just been such a great experience to have that counter there. So another reason to count, harvest. In Massachusetts, I have a nice old-timey photo here from Maine, but that's largely part of our past for the most part. Brad did talk about we do have one run with sustainable fishery management plan now in the state, so if they chose to open, they could. But for most of Massachusetts, that's not something that's currently happening. Zooming out to a, greater, a bigger scale, counts are important for state and coastwide management of these resources. There's a difference here where we jump from having just visual counts to usually a different method, in which is why I'm here talking to you. Uh, we're talking about typically an electronic counter or video, something that's going to give a higher accuracy count, hopefully, that can be used when you build up a long enough time series in interstate management. Brad talked a little bit about that in his talk as well. So first, before I dive into the next 20 minutes, I'm going to say, it's not for everybody, really. Um, they require, you have to have experience, uh, hopefully some good electrical experience, experience working in water, uh, audio visual. It's a lot of hours within a field season, um, and the field season drags on a long time, especially if you have both alewife and bluebacks in your system. Uh, it's not really conducive to having your life. You have to work your life around the count rather than say, all right, you know, I'm, I have my 10 minutes that I can put into my day, or maybe I do three counts in a day, so I have half an hour, you know, three days a week. It doesn't operate like that. It's going to break whenever it wants to and frequently. That's what, when you put something in the water, that's what happens, unfortunately. So, and I'd also say if you're somebody who's thinking you, know, you have a river that you want to monitor, the larger space you have to cover, whether it's an electronic resistance counter or a video counter, the more space you have to cover, the harder it is to do. So what this means is that they're generally, these methods are generally better suited to state or federal agencies that have dedicated staff where it's part of their everyday duties to do this. What happens when you don't have that typically is that you have big coverage gaps. Here's an electronic resistance counter. Three days, even though there's a comment in here that if I do this, well, nope. Okay, even though there's a comment, we have more debris around the counter than three days passed between checks. And when I showed up, that was actually, sorry, I'll go backwards for a second. That's what we found. This is my 65-year-old father digging debris off the counter. Um, he said he wanted to come to work for me, so well, that's what he got. Um, you, you know, all the tubes were blocked with debris. Fish couldn't pass. And so we have three days' worth of counts that had to be censored because we don't know whether or not those counts are real. Fish could be, are, are they, they're going into the tube, but we don't know, are the tubes, we don't know if they're actually passing through. So if a fish just sits in a tube, it counts and it counts and it counts and it counts, but that, so you're basically getting like eight, 10, 15 counts on one fish that never actually passed. So you're producing an overcount. So that leads to having to censor counts. 
and you know the quality of the count is no longer acceptable for the use of why we put this counter there. And I've just gone through an example with a counter. Video is typically worse. It requires even more attention. So now that my cautionary notes are expended for a few minutes, I'll get back to them. Um, I'll go into different methods. So there's many ways to scale a fish. You could use a multi-tube counter, which is what, if you're going to use a counter, we saw an example earlier in the day of a single tube counter that we loaned out. Uh, the multi-tube counter is a better way to go. It's gonna give a higher accuracy count, especially at, uh, as John did a really nice study with Mike Bednarski, as passage rates increase and you have more and more fish, those single tube counters, the accuracy starts to drop pretty precipitously. So you're no longer getting it, you're getting an undercount now because that single tube counter has a wider diameter, so multiple fish can go through at once. I can see people shaking their heads as they look at fish going through tiny tubes. So there's a lot of people who don't, uh, if, it, if you can make these things work, they work really well. But we'll get into that as we go. Um, you could also use video. That's another option. You can put them at weirs as you would typically count fish. You can put them in the middle of a stream. So there's lots of options. There is a great deal of flexibility here as long as certain things line up. I'm going to briefly talk about these methods in comparison to a visual count. So as most people here are doing visual methods, you kind of know the ins and outs. Uh, a lot in Massachusetts are done either in Rideout or Nelson's methods, which is great. It's better than going out and randomly counting, but it's all based on statistical extrapolations. So Gary was taking a theoretical distribution of how fish might move, or different distributions, and saying, well, if, you, if they do move that way, you'd want to sample this way and this many times to get an idea of what that would actually, number of fish would be. But the problem is that where we have actual 24-hour counts, we're seeing a wide variety over the, the course of a season or even the course of a day in when fish movement occurs. So especially if you have a run, not all runs are like this, but there are some runs with a lot of night movement, all of a sudden you're really far off with your visual count. So as going back a little bit, as I said earlier, visual counts are an appropriate index for local knowledge, limited management on a local level. They're in the ballpark, so they're really great to see the time series of visual counts for us, because if something is happening, it is gonna clue us off to that. We are gonna know that there was a big change if there is a large change in the number of fish in a visual count. It's very valuable. But making that next bar up and using it in interstate management, that's where it gets harder. And I can't stress this enough. I mean, I, I think I sound a little bit like a negative Nancy sometime about visual counts. Like going and participating in your community, participating in your ecosystem is so important. So I think like I get nervous when I put a counter in, especially if there is a visual count somewhere, because I don't want to see that visual count go away. Because it's such an important touchstone, especially without harvest in many communities now, for people to stay involved with their river, involved with the species. So it's super important to keep those up, and, and I, so I'm on here talking about the, you know, the advantages or like whether the superiority of maybe of this way of counting. I think they both have their uses, and they're both super important. So again, this is what we're talking about as an example. Brad showed the eels. This is for river herring. This is from the last stock assessment. A little small, but if you look on the bottom here, what you'll see is that these time series are all beginning before 2000 and some go back into the 80s and 70s. And that's really the scope of time we need to see what's really happening with a population. 10 years is the bar we've set for ASMFC. I can tell you going through the stock assessment in most categories of, like, of data we looked at, anything with less than 15 years, we didn't see the pattern, much like Brad had his 40 years and his 20 years. You look at the 20 years, you're like, okay, everything's peachy keen, we're on a flat, we're stable. But when you go back far enough, you start seeing the declines. And it was the same way with river herring. If you had data from the 80s, 70s, those runs, you start seeing some declines. The other ones appear stable, even though it's probably stable at a not ideal level. So picking a technology, I'm going to go through the electronic counter, the multi-tube electronic counter, the video, and I'm going to briefly, briefly touch on uh, some acoustic counters. So the advantages when you're looking at different technologies and what you might want to implement in your river of a, a multi-tube counter are that it's a real-time count. 
So that means as long, however often time period you want to check, you can go every day and you're going to know what your count is as long as it's being operated, which is really great. You know, on all our counters now, or almost all our counters, we all, we'll have a sign on them saying exactly what the count for the total for the year is, how many fish passed in the last day, and it's a great community outreach tool so people know what's going on with their run. It's a 24-hour count as opposed to visual counts as I've covered before. You usually don't go overnight, and it's frankly difficult because river herring don't really like visible spectrum light, so when you start going putting lights on a river, you're probably going to alter their behavior. Um, it's adaptable to runs of all sizes. You can put 600, 700,000 fish through one of these counters if it's run well, uh, or you can put 5,000 fish, and you're going to get a good count. As long as you're running the counter well and it's well designed and located, you'll get an accurate count. Low power requirements, very low, which is awesome. Very adaptable to solar installations, great. Not affected by turbidity. It's, as I said, it's good for outreach. And once you buy the equipment, it's cheap to run. Disadvantages, you're not going to get any species. And it's, so it's really good for rivers where you just have, for migratory fish or fish that you're even in river fish that you're concerned about blocking, the biggest fish is a river herring or close to it. And you're just, you know during that time period you have the, fit, the counter in the river. You're going to count other species of fish, but it's going to get swamped out by the thousands and thousands and thousands of river herring. So if you count 150,000 river herring and there's 3,000 other fish in there, it's really part of the error and that's it's still better than you're going to do with any other method. It does have a moderate initial cost. You're talking about 10 to 15,000, 12 to 15,000 dollars in your initial investment into this. And then after that, very low cost to run. Probably less than 100, 200 dollars a year to run. It is sens uh, sensitive to fluctuations in conductivity. That's how it works. It's testing the, con the, con uh, the conductance of the water. It's a resistance bridge. And so when a fish swims through and, and changes that resistance, then it gets registered as a count. So if you're in a system, I've had systems where I put these in that have a lot of wells that get discharged into the river. And when the town pumps the wells, all of a sudden my counter goes, <laughs> just starts counting magically. So it's not, it ended up not being a good place. And I didn't know that until I put the counter in the river. But if you can do some background scouting and look for stable systems, I think it's a rarity, but it's out there. Um, most importantly, it will bottleneck your migration if you don't maintain it. And that's true for the single tube counters as well. If you don't design it, like good site location, good design, and do proper maintenance, check it every day, you're going to have problems with passage. That's going to happen. If flow gets too high, fish are, going, are not going to be able to get through the tube. If the flow gets too low, they're going to have trouble locating the tubes. You know, the, so you can have a lot of different issues that arise with these counters if you're not spending a lot of time making sure they run properly. Moving on to video. You can get a good 24 hour count. Uh, a lot of cameras now can flip between visible spectrum and IR light and that's what you're looking for, infrared light. The fish don't see it. It does not change their behaviors, which is great. You still get good records at night, but the fish behavior isn't affected. You can speciate among fish. So instead of just, you know, you just have counts with, the, with an electronic counter video, you're not going to tell the difference between an alewife and a blueback. But you're going to tell the difference between all the different stuff that's going through. Uh, you end up seeing some awesome stuff. You end up seeing ducks, beavers, otters, everything, cormorants swimming through with your fish in their mouth. It's, it's great. So you see a lot of different things, um, which is really neat. Uh, you get a, so it's really, I'd say that electronic counters are good for outreach. Video is great for outreach. I mean, you should be able to put that stuff up on your Facebook page. Jane did that this year. Uh, you can put this stuff everywhere, and it's really great to just reach out to people who are interested in your river. And because you're usually looking at a two to three foot unobstructed passage, you're talking about any, you know, you're not, unless something really bad happens, you're not going to be obstructing your migration. You're going to have pretty good movement of fish through that without losing fish in your population. Disadvantage, there's going to be a count lag, unlike the electronic counter when you're getting this daily update, you're only going to get a count as fast as you can watch the video. And obviously when you're spending a lot of time running around, working on your river, doing other things, making sure everything's working right, that lag can get substantial if you don't have the staff to watch all the video in a timely fashion. All of a sudden you're getting, your count's getting two, three, four weeks behind. And if you want to be telling people in season what the run's looking like, then that gets difficult. 
And the other side of that is just the amount of time. It literally is, if you're talking about a run over 20,000 fish, hundreds and hundreds of hours of staff time to watch a video. So, you know, that's even with motion detection programs where you are watch, where you're really, hopefully if it's run well, again, this goes to the maintenance side, you're just getting videos of fish. It's a lot of time, you still have to watch and count all those fish. And especially towards the end of a migration, when you have fish coming up, fish going down, in a lot of cases, it gets lengthy. Higher power demands in the electronic counter as well. Uh, it's not as friendly, it can be done with solar, but it's hard, it's a lot more work. Uh, very sensitive to turbidity, you know, as Brad was talking about, we see more eutrophication in a lot of our coastal systems. So in mid to late May, when that kicks in, all of a sudden your image quality in your video starts to tank and you can't, where you might have had really good video early in the season, and you can see across two feet of water really well. Come May, maybe you can only see eight to 12 inches, and you're missing fish in the back, or it's just very cloudy. Also difficult to count fish in very high volume passage situations, where you just have big groups of fish coming in and they're stacking through the entire image. It makes it difficult to accurately count fish. So I, my general guidance here is that for over, if it runs larger, if you think it runs larger than 100,000 fish, that's a good break point to say like, maybe video just isn't worth it for the purpose of its estimating account. If you wanna put in video to have videos of fish, have videos of everything else swimming through your river, great. But if you're gonna say, I wanna produce a, a high accuracy count, the amount of effort expended is, I. We did this on the Charles, which is about 300 to 400,000 fish every year for two years, and it was three to three and a half months of one person's 40-hour weeks. So it's a, it's a large chunk of time. Uh, these two things, the high investment in processing video to produce a count, and uh, very time consuming, really, uh, I'm sorry, it, there's different things happening right now. I think Joel was working in MATLAB, we said last year, to try and do some counting automated. There's been various groups who have tried to automate counts. I haven't seen it done successfully yet, and I think until I see it done successfully, unless you want to tell me you've made, no. <laughs> Usually when somebody comes to me and says, I'm working on automating an account to count these things, I'm like, I hope it works, uh, but not in a bad way. It's just, I, I'd love to see it done. I just don't know that it's gonna happen. So, very quickly, there's then machines like the Didson and the Vaki Sea Viewer, which are working on different principles. Especially for the D Didson, I, if nobody's seen this before, I put this picture up here. And it's really the same thing as video, it's just sonar. So you still gotta, you even have less ability than a video to speciate your fish. And you gotta figure out how to interpret that and count it. The advantage of this is that turbidity does not matter anymore. So uh, Brad was talking about mid-Atlantic blueback herring. Part of our issues uh, interstate is that we have no idea what's going on in the mid-Atlantic because it's low-grade, muddy rivers. Nobody's counting fish in these rivers. Two years ago, somebody at Smithsonian bought one of these Didsons, as I point out, huge initial cost, $70,000. They'll lease you one for a year for like 20. But uh, a lot of, it's an expensive, expensive unit. A lot of investment in watching these things, same as the video. But he put this in a river in the Chop Tank, which is a tributary of the Chesapeake Bay and they got like 1.2, 1.3 million fish estimated. So that, so, you know, that was like, I think it was like 500,000 ale wife, 700,000 blue back, somewhere like that. And that's just a river where before it was just a big question mark. They knew from pound nets there were river herring, but they had no idea how many. So I have not had any experience with this technology outside of talking to people who have implemented it. I think that for, I'm not even interested in it and I wouldn't suggest it to anybody in here. But if anybody has any questions, I can point them in the right direction. So, briefly going through the advantages and disadvantages of each technology, I think there's some really basic guiding questions we can all look at when we want to think about doing this. First off, I would always say you should leave with, do we have the available power, people hours to do this, and the expertise to do this? That should be your first question starting. If the answer is no, don't do it. Just keep doing what you're doing because it's valuable. If the answer is yes or could be yes, then keep moving down the list. What species do you want to count? Do you want to count all your diadromous species? Do you just want to count river herring? Are there larger body diadromous or resident species you are worried about blocking? 
because if that's the case, if you have a shad run along with your river herring run, but you're really interested in the river herring, the tubes go out of the, go out the window because they're going to block shad. How large is your run? Like I said, if you're going above 100,000 fish, then you might want to think about maybe, even though you have, you thought you had enough staff hours and expertise, maybe you don't. What power sources are available? You're still able to choose between the two technologies at this point. It's a heck of a lot easier to power a counter than it is to do a video monitoring station. Unless you have AC available on site, and then you're whatever you want to do. And finally, water quality. Your turbidity might be an issue, as I mentioned before, or maybe very rarely a case with conductivity. Anybody has questions throughout this? I know I'm just rambling. It's like a massive brain dump for me, so you can ask me <laughs> as we go. So we'll get into the more of the nitty gritty of things. Here's your basic SMITH uh, Route 1601. This is, so it can have up to 16 channels. Uh, electronic counter, you can see the counting head. Let's see if I can call them up do this. Almost up there. Uh, this is a set of solar, so you have on the lower part of this enclosure a, uh, the countering box itself where you can look at the numbers. And then on top you can see the little battery tender and batteries hooked up to a solar unit. Uh, 50 watt panel hooked up to a group 24 battery and you really don't need to worry about anything as long as that solar panel and battery work for the course of the season. You never have to worry about swapping out batteries, power outages, anything like that. So super simple, 500 bucks and you're in business and you know, every couple of years you replace that battery. It's really nice. As I said before, so here's an up close of the box. It's fairly simple to use. Here's the, what a typical head might look like or array. You have, uh, this one was an eight tube array. And it, you can see, hopefully, that these are about, they're 20 inch, uh, you want to base your tube size on the size of fish you're trying to count. For a river herring, that's a that's, you're looking at a four inch diameter, a 20 inch long tube, and then you have three anodes within that tube, evenly spaced. And, you, and, they, and so like, Smith Root will try and sell you a counting head for thousands of dollars. You can see, as you can see, this is just PVC, hose clamps, and wiring. It's under $400, and the really expensive part is the wiring. Uh, but you can do everything yourself. You, know, you can see the screening here to guide fish into the tubes. So you can attach it. This one would be one that would be attached to the exit of a fishway. There's another example of one in the water attached to the exit of a fishway. This is really nice. This is in Pembroke. Uh, and it's just on Alaska Steep Pass. So like I said, it's a small volume of water to have to worry about, an area of water. So it, it makes things easier. Here. Yeah, oh, you should. <laughs> Art does 95% of the work on this, but. Yeah, but um, is there any reason why you don't have uh, a mechanism to count the fish, count the counters that you have? Someone has to go there and write it down. Why is it that computerized? It, it seems like it would be a lot more accurate. So you're worried about people writing down the wrong number on the sheet? Well, yeah, or forgetting to go where some other people might have to get money out. Well, you have to go. I want people to go every day. I go every day uh, because if you don't go every day and clean the thing, you're going to get into problems. So you don't want to get people an excuse not to go because then you end up blocking fish and having a bad count. So you always want people to go. Um, quite, uh, we have played around with attaching kind of like a backup and also giving you like an exact second the fish like a count gets registered on the machine. Hobo makes a product that John found that we've been using. Um, the problem with that is that the electronic counters can produce a count every tenth of a second, and that Hobo add-on only registers a count every second. So at high volumes, you have mismatches between the number of fish that you're getting on the counter and you're getting on this little backup machine that also gives you like true dial movements, like 24-hour movements, not just when you check it. I found one other product that might work, but it's a little cost prohibitive. It's like $3,800. So adding that on so far has not been one that I think like the benefit's going to outweigh the amount of money I'm going to put into it. Yeah, Joanne. Uh, can the outfit uh, provide a time stamp on the counts? That's what, that's what I was just talking about. There's this, uh, this, uh, yeah, this ho either this Hobo or this other product. You could do that, and then you have true dial movements. Um, I've written some R code to go through and hopefully weed out error counts, 
so you still get an idea of when movement's occurring, even though your counts don't match up or like completely 100%. So you can see that timestamp, and, and I have it for a couple different runs. But uh, again, it's uh, on our side, it comes down to the amount of time we're putting into something and whether or not it's worth it from a management perspective. It's kind of like the kind of the cold hard part where it gets to. And we haven't. The dial movements are very interesting and it's great to see the variation among rivers and it gives us a better understanding of how to manage our rivers. But the management upshot isn't gigantic for us. So it's not something, I like I would totally help anybody who wanted to do that, but it's not something that I'm gonna sink a lot of time into because when I put it, you know, Brad kind of put our priority list up there. When I put that up against our priority list, it doesn't scream out this needs to be done. So as I said before, uh, the nice thing about these is they can be easily powered by a combination of solar and battery. Battery. If you do have AC power on your site, you can use that. However, uh, the electronics in these machines are highly sensitive to voltage fluctuations, like super duper sensitive. Just having your standard plug-in $10 uh, circuit breaker is not going to work. Your power strip is not going to help. If you have a lightning strike, it will fry. <laughs> you're, you're, $10,000 piece of machinery. So uh, the recommendation here is to have your AC power plugged into a battery tender, and then that to a battery, and then that to then hook up the machine to the battery. So don't have it running on AC, have it running on DC. If you do have some type of voltage spike on your system, the battery is gonna absorb that spike, and it's not gonna get to your machine. So the, uh, even though you have AC power, you, I, we still recommend you buy the battery. I learned this the hard way. So buy the battery. <laughs> and hook it up. Yeah, Rick. We probably be Oh, yep. Yeah. I don't know if, uh, so yeah, a lot of these, oh, I'm not going to go all the way back. A lot of these pictures have been from Pembroke. Uh-oh. Sorry, I'm going down. Yeah. Yes. Um, Sorry, I was hitting the wrong buttons. Yeah, you can't see it in that picture, but you can see what Rick's alluding to here um, is this right here. It's just a piece of four inch PVC sealed off, and then it has about 12 inches of one inch mesh, wire mesh, uh, rubber coated wire mesh going into the water, and that helps a lot with debris, um, both video and electronic counters, you're going to want to have something to keep the debris away from your, or minimize the amount of debris that's actually going into your system. Or whatever you can do to get debris away, it's going to make your life easier. I thought it was pretty interesting too that um, even though we, check, we check that sometimes more than twice a day, sometimes three or four times a day, you could actually see if we were having one night passage. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think especially your guys' system, they have to make this move through a very shallow stretch where there's a lot of birds, then they get a nice deep holding pool, and then they have the fish ladder. And I think the, the fish that don't pass during the night are kind of like, I'm gonna hang out in this deep pool because I've been getting pecked at for the last 24 hours getting here, so this is a good place. And I think that's, uh, we hear a lot of complaints from Cape Cod systems, which are these low gradient, shallow systems that like our runs are at night. This is the, you know, if we do this visual count, it's an undercount. And I, I completely agree. Because I think when you just think about it, a fish in a big river is not gonna be like a Mystic or a Charles River. It's not concerned nearly as much by bird predation because they don't have to worry about as much of that overhead, seagulls, anything like that. Because they're never, they're always in deeper water. So they can move during the day. You get into a Cape Cod stream that's, you know, skinnier than between these two tables and is a foot and a half deep you have every type of avian predator is going to be able to exploit you at that point. So it makes a lot more sense to migrate at night. So with these, as I said, I've stressed so far, site location, very important. Design, very important. This is the first year of a counter we put in the back river. Didn't think about it that hard. We put it right in because there was an available board slot. You can see it was right by this curve. We had huge issues with delaying the run at certain points when it got really heavy because the fish would get in there. They had all these different eddies coming up in front of the tubes. You could put your arm down there and just feel all this conflicting flow and the fish wouldn't pass through in a very timely fashion. That whole area would fill up with fish and then they'd freak out and they'd find the tubes and go. So they would go through, but it was not an ideal situation. Next year, we moved it back. 
another two feet and that in 2017. So that was 2015 in the first image, 2016 in the second. This year I moved it back another two feet and now it's working very, very well. So again, there's a learning curve here. You learn as you go. But it's really important. You want to give fish a straight shot. You want to have adequate flow through your tubes so that they orient to them. You know, anybody who watches these fish in rivers, they're very flow oriented, they're reataxic. So you want to think about that when you're designing a counter. And I really encourage everybody to get a flow meter if you're going to do this and go out every, as part of your check every day, be taking flow measurements. You want three to five feet per second through the tubes. It, that's really the in-lab work that's been done with river herring that matches up pretty well to their range. It's enough flow to get them oriented to the tubes but not, and get them to move through the tube quickly because again, you don't want fish hanging out in the tube either because there's not enough flow in, there, in the tube and they're confused about where to go or there's too much flow and they can't get out of the tube. You're going to end up having multiple counts for every fish. Did you find that uh, with sunlight like hit the tube, that it's too bright? Or like the sunlight either on the back and the front end effect? I haven't found a lot of that. Um, on these tubes here, one of the local guys running them thought that they didn't like being able to see the, not being, they, he thought that they couldn't see like the light at the end of the tunnel. And so I installed the LED, LED lights on the end, and he ran that for a while and, sorry, and then said, it doesn't matter, which is kind of my opinion. I think with these tubes, light gradients, I think harsh light gradients in river make a big difference for these fish. I've seen in plenty of video installations before they started using IR, where you'd see a fish at night swim into the video frame, hit that light, and go right back out. Just say, nope. You see a, some fish would pass, you see a lot of fish hit that light field and just go, oh, I'm going to come back later. So I think light is important, but with the, with the tubes, I have not noticed that. So I just showed you this monster of a array head. That's a 14 tube system. It's uh, the back river. So that's like a 350 to 450,000 fish a year run. Um, when you see a run like that, a lot of people say, you have to use all the tubes. Use all the tubes you possibly can. I, I've, used the, I've made these systems. I've helped run these systems in a wide variety of systems and my, you know, local involvement's always, institutional knowledge, as Brad said, is always going to be important. I would really advocate early and often to all of you that you want to use as few tubes as you possibly can. It's going to give the fish limited options. They're going to be able to orient. You're going to be able to manage flow better. There, I have seen 50, 60, 70,000 fish in a 24-hour period go through four tubes. We all watch these fish in rivers. They like to be on the bottom. They like to orient to the center of the flow. That's where they're going to go. So there's certain situations that are going to dictate more than that. If you have a four-foot denial, putting all your flow for a four-foot denial through four tubes isn't going to happen. But use as few tubes as you possibly can. Keep, give them a clean, like a clean flow-wise approach to the tubes, and they're going to pass through in a timely manner, and you're going to get a good count. How are you, man? So, um, I'm trying to think what the best. So this picture that I just popped up, um, I would, I blocked off tubes. This this counter this year, I had that whole water area of water over those grates blocked off, and I actually then also closed down. It, again, as I say, you want just that that center of flow is where the fish are going to go. And when we after a year or two, you you look at the data, you say, okay, you know what? All my counts, the fish almost never used those corner tubes, those side tubes. They were all, it was all through, mostly through the center of the bottom and some in the center in the top row. And so we just closed off those tubes. And then so we're getting more flow through, we're getting the flow rates we wanted through those center tubes. And even then, I'd like to cut off more tubes because we were getting two and a half to three here. Um, I've gone to other sites where you have a back of a five, 600 fish and your flow is all wrong. So you block off bar racks, you do what you need to do. So you kind of all your flow is going by the counter, going through the tubes at a good rate. You come back an hour later and you have, you know, the 800, 1500 counts on the machine and there's no fish sitting below your weir anymore. So it works, but you just got to spend the time, again, it's time to modify your system and you're never going to get it right on the first shot. And it's going to change with flow levels in the river through the course of the year. So you have to spend the time as you go through the system to check on it and you know the first year is hard because you don't know what you're doing yet you don't know how the fish are going to react to your system the next year gets easier the year after that gets easier it kind of becomes more automatic but you have to understand what how to manage your each specific site to get the flows you want
I hope, hopefully that's helpful. And part of that, that's a great question, leads right into this. You really need to perform test counts as often as you possibly can because the number that you're getting on your machine isn't necessarily the number of fish that pass. Anytime it's feasible when you show up and there's fish passing or there's fish below a fish weight and you can kind of induce them to pass, um, whether that's banging a stick on the side of a fish weight or doing something like that, you have two people, thank you, I'm going to have to speed up or go be late. But, um, you want to try and get a count. You want to have somebody watching the end, of the exit of that counter, and somebody watching the counter, so you can have. All right, this is how many fish we actually saw pass. This is how much of the counter set. Because you can adjust. It, you can adjust the machine. As I said, it's all based on conduct conductivity. So you can change that resistance. If anybody buys one of these and doesn't talk to me, this little knob on the upper left says sensitivity. It's not sensitivity. It's resistance. So if you, th you think sensitivity and you're, you know, it's just counterintuitive because you're going to be like, oh, I'm going to keep cranking that up because I'm not getting counts. But really, you're, you're increasing the resistance, so it's making it harder for that bridge to flip and get a count. So when you first get this, you want to get your conductivity of your water before you talk to Smith Root. They'll tune it up in-house, and then you can play with that knob. But you're basically, when you first plug it in, if you have that sensitivity all the way down, you should just be seeing counts pop up because there's no resistance. And you start cranking that sensitivity up, and that's going to stop. And that's usually where a good starting place for before you have fish coming through where you want the sensitivity knob. But it's somewhat counterintuitive. So now I go back to this picture. Two of the people there, of the five people watching, this are actually my staff. This is what you do. They're, they're watching. You can see that whiteboard with the counter down in the river. They're watching fish to count how many fish are coming through in a time period so that we can go look at the counter and do that. And so that's something you should do any time there's fish passing. And I'll stress that it's a good idea to have these white, you know, a white board or some or a retroflective board attached to the exit of your counter to make it easier to count how many fish are coming through. Because it can be very difficult if you don't have a nice backdrop to count fish against. As how you guys are all visual counters, you know that. All right, video monitoring systems. This is what we're hopefully all looking for when we get a video monitoring system idea in our head. We're looking for like this nice, clean water. Everything looks good. You can see the fish passing through. It's really easy to count. That's great. You know, that's what we, I think the mental image of what we all have a video. This is the best video I have. You know, <laughs> this is not the reality of a lot of video situations. And it can be avoided, but like getting this means, again, checking once or twice a day and doing everything the right way. So much like the electronic counter, a video system is really two components. It's the video camera and enclosure, and then a mo paired to a motion detection software, which is going to save you thousands of hours because you never have to hopefully watch any dead tape. This is where it comes into the maintenance, too. Maintenance for video systems isn't necessarily about blocking fish. It's about not having to watch junk video. The more hours you put in keeping this clean, keeping light out of the enclosure, because all these motion detection programs are super sensitive to light fluctuations, that'll set off the motion detection the less video you have to watch and you get to the point where you're only watching fish, then you can get through a count a lot faster than if you have to watch a 15 minute long video clip of a stick waving in the background because, you know, it, the motion detection is going off the whole time so you have video, but maybe you can't not watch it because maybe there's 20, 30, 40 fish during that 15 minutes that pass. So you have to watch the whole thing. Sometimes there's no fish, sometimes there's fish, but it adds a lot of video watching. If you have beavers, just forget it. It gets ugly. <laughs> so yeah, so yeah, here you have a typical video enclosure. Um, and then you can use, right now most people are using either Salmon Soft or iSpy. Uh, the top image is an example of iSpy, the bottom is a Salmon Soft image. The first step in video monitoring is going to be design. I, if you are going to do video and there's nobody on your staff who has experience with SketchUp, haven't spent a day with this program, it's going to save a lot of energy. It's a great program. You can go from designing something in, you know, in the computer to having to handing it over to somebody who can build it themselves, or you can build it yourself and you have it all planned out for you. Um, really great. When you have water elevation data, that's even better. This is the one, uh, Andy will talk a lot more about this later, but when we decided to do this at Upper Mystic Lakes, I had water, theoretical water elevation data from, D, uh, from uh, DCR, so I could kind of plan where everything would go, how many boards we needed to put underneath everything. It's going to tell you, you can give people something where you can view it from every possible angle. And it can also get an idea of, all right, if I, when you have a field of view, calc you calculate your field of view, you can figure out exactly pretty close what your 
camera angle is going to look like. Well, that's, you know, that was pretty close to what we had. And that was just me sitting on a computer in March designing it. And I said, okay, this is where we need to, how large our video box needs to be. This is how far away it needs to be. You can do all those calculations beforehand so you're not stuck with something that isn't going to work. And you can also figure out your dead zones. And we were able to design this. I made that bottom riser high enough so that we really had a full view, field of view across the entire water column and we weren't worried about missing fish above or below the camera if they came close to the viewing window. And then if you have a guy like Ed Clark, it all gets built for you and you only get the phone calls when he tells you you've designed something really stupid, which happens. <laughs> <laughs> but Ed's great. Um, these are services that we do. We, we, I'll get, if I get to the end of this thing ever, then uh, <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll get into that. But, uh, Here's us installing the Mystic, which you guys will see a lot more about. So enclosure checklist, adequate shading, tight covers. Again, light is your enemy. It will, if you have fluctuations in light over the course of the day, you're going to have a lot more video to watch. You need to keep fish out of your, away from your camera. Uh, we recommend a 3M product that's horribly expensive. It's the stuff when you see a stop sign now and your, and your headlights hit it and it glows. It's that same retroreflective material that everybody's familiar with that all the signs have now. Um, it does a great job. You don't need to throw a lot of light at them at night and you can see everything. Uh, speed bumper riser and then uh, an IR light source. Uh, we have been using the C-Viewer camera. If you Google Z-Viewer, uh, C oh, I have a, a typo, C-Drop 950, you'll get to their website. It's a company in Florida. Uh, we've had a federal scientist who plays the video a lot, bench tested a bunch of cameras and he came back and said, yep, that's the camera to use right now. Uh, so I, we pretty strongly recommend this camera. It's, I think the way I like it, it's $845. So it's you know, an order of magnitude less than that electronic counter. You add in a couple hundred bucks for the laptop, everything else, and you're looking at $1,200 to $1,300. So, but that's what you'll end up with, hopefully. And I just want to use this to talk about, I don't know what you guys can see from there. Hopefully it's not too dark. But that, so that dark mass on the bottom is actually something I fabricated that sits inside there and makes the fish come up into the field of view. You need to have one of those in your video. If you don't, you're going to miss fish along the bottom, especially, it'll look great during the day, but at night, that becomes a really dark area that doesn't get any light, and you'll miss fish. Software, I spy in SalmonSoft. I have my, my newest in my motion detection area, so as long as I don't have an alert that it's recording, I know I can keep working, so that's good. Um, they're both really complicated. I'm not going to go into it, but again, this is the thing where training, staff, hours, all comes to play because you have to know how to manipulate the software to get what you want or else you're going to have a lot of, you're either going to miss fish or you're going to have too much video that you don't need to watch. Uh, quick comparison, iSpy is free, which is awesome. The really big things here is iSpy is free, SalmonSoft is not. iSpy, you get your video and what you want to do with it is your choice. SalmonSoft for your $5,000, I think what you're really getting at this point since there's so many freeware motion detection programs is a counting console, so you load the videos into that and you're watching on your computer and you can program your keyboard for different species up like plus or minus and you just sit there watching the video hitting the plus or minus for whatever species you're seeing and as you're doing that, it's populating an Excel spreadsheet that's time stamped with that exact moment you hit the key and what you saw and whether it was going up or down. So you just watch the video, hit buttons and you get your data sheet for you. Whereas if you do iSpy, you need to have your own data sheet and keep track of everything as you go. So if that $5,000 is worth it for you, then it's worth it for you. However, again, neither software solves the need for lots and lots of hours in front of the computer watching video. So, beating the dead horse, a lot of planning, a lot of expertise and resources, and a lot of dedication over the course of the year because you're, what you're also gonna find out is that fish showed up two weeks earlier than you thought they did and they left two or three weeks later than you thought they did based on your volunteer data. The, the, the kind of tail ends of this migration are longer than what you typically think they are. So it's a long season. This is really important in that poor location selection design or execution can have negative effects on migratory fish passage. We take this very seriously. It's part of what we do is making sure that we have good fish passage. At no point is account worth affecting the population. So it's really important to think about where we put these in and where they may or may not be appropriate and what harm you may be doing if you don't do it well. Uh, we've moved to a system in the last five years where we are, you need to get approval from DMF to put a counter in a river. 
we've run into situations where we have pulled counters because they were not being properly maintained and they were impeding passage. We don't want to see that. If that is a habitual thing, then you're not going to get approval to put a counter in anymore. And again, it goes back to wanting to put one in and making the money investment to do it is only part of it. You have to spend all the hours to do it too or it's not going to work. And it can never hurt your run. So the upside is that when you do everything right, you can get a really great count. And in the case of river herring, if you have a river herring run only, we really strongly advocate in using that electronic resistivity counter, the Smith root. It's the easier, in the long run, way to go. We, we truly believe. <clears throat> What's that? It's probably depending on what you have available to you and the site, whether you're doing, it's going to be more expensive to do it in stream or if you're just putting it on the exit of a fishway, somewhere in like the thirteen to $15,000 range. What, what you want to trick it out with, how many tubes you want to do, everything else. So I mean, you're looking, depending on whether you get salmon soft or not, you're looking at like 2500 to $3,000 to $8,000 for video but you don't have all the video watching time on, on the counter. So. so if you're still interested in doing this, you think you have the right river to do it, we're, the good news is that we are here to help you do it. We want to help you do it. This is important data for us. Uh, we'll happily provide any technical advice and support to you. I will stress again that any county installation needs to be reviewed, approved, and permitted by DMF. So you should talk to Brad Chase or myself uh, we are, even if you have a group of people who wants to do it and you think you can pull it off, it, Brad or I may say that, you know, in the scheme of things, it's, you, know, you do these counts primarily for, like I said, interstate management. It's a data point for us. It may not be a high value site to the ASMFC. So there's times where you may not like the answer you get. And I apologize for that. but. I, I, any one of these things that goes in and is well run, it's, it's, we're talking about dozens if not hundreds of hours of our staff time in the first year or two that goes into them, so we need to be a little picky on where we put them to. And I will also add that planning should begin now. Like if you want to do this in 2018, you should be coming and talking to us now because as I said, we're going to need to review, so that means that we're going to have to go talk to you about it, do site visits, take measurements, design something, talk about potential in-river modifications, fabrication, blah, blah, blah. It's a long process, so the time to begin that discussion is now. It's not February, January, February, March. If you come to us then, we'll politely say it and we'll talk to you in the fall. And uh, this type of stuff and a lot of other things, I, I help coordinate an interstate panel of river herring biologists and we've been working on a guidance document and hopefully sometime in the next calendar 2018 we'll finally have our guidance document out. There's a lot of people like John and Abby and probably some others I'm forgetting about in the room who are working on this. So it should just be a amass all the knowledge we have kind of in New England of on managing river herring with us, transport, run management, in-stream modifications, aging, everything, including this stuff that'll be in there. And I think that's it. So if I have time for questions, I will take them. I don't know where we're Fritz, what's up? Yeah, I need just some time. I'll make it quick. Four years ago, I was trying to like video counter, turbidity, and count drill this to two years ago with like Johnny County working with Big 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 or the kind of property thing. It worked really well. You can hear numbers like 5,000, 7,000, 12,000. Probably the best five bucks we spent on it. Phone calls and comments and 50, you know, supervisors yeah. that we had originally all went down and they could see that. Yeah. That's awesome. It's huge. Yeah, Eric. Sorry. Yeah, um, one, one thing, uh, a subset of one of the disadvantages of electronic commerce that um, cropped up in New Hampshire at the Hampshire River uh, counting station this past year was lampreys. Oh, yeah, I did not mention that. Lampreys don't work. Lampreys. <laughs> and again, you see it with that timestamp. Uh, product I was talking about you can put on there is you can tell when there's a lamprey in there. A, you walk up to your counter in the morning and like three, if you have a four tube system, three of your tubes say 100 and like between 100 and 200 and then one of the tubes says like 12,000 and you're like, well that's not right. And then you look and you can basically see like 
this lamprey going in and out. It's like, it'll be like five minutes steady of detections and then it'll end for 20 minutes. Then it goes in another tube and there's 12 minutes of like steady, you know, all right, so yeah. Yeah, they get halfway. If you ever watch a lamprey, the way they do things is they swim five feet, especially in higher flows. They swim five feet and they suck on and rest, just holding on with their mouth for however long they need to rest for, and then they try and swim again. So you end up having these fish get into these higher velocity environments in the tube, suck on, and just sit in there. And you're, the whole time they're in there, your counter thinks there's fish passing, so it's cranking up. You can find me after this if you have any more questions. Yeah, like I said, we get a